Our study is entitled Faith. Oh, faith is one of the much used words in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, and it is a very significant concept. So what we're going to discuss today really is very, very significant in terms of uh, what it means to be a Christian and what it means to live that Christian life. Faith is a key to so many things in our walk with the Lord. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to do what? To please the Lord. Without faith it is impossible to please the Lord. Well that's quite a strong statement. So what I want you to do is to take your worksheet and let's by way of introduction talk about what faith is not before we look at the concept of faith from the biblical perspective. What are some of the misunderstandings with regard to faith? Now I'm going to cover a few, but if there are some others that come to your mind, jot those down because we have discussion periods coming up and I want you to have the freedom when we get into those discussion periods to feed those kind of comments and questions and uh, into uh, the group here so we can uh, learn from your insights as well as from the things that I have prepared here. All right, the first misconception. Number one, some mistake faith in God for an optimistic attitude toward life. This is not so much, I think, found inside the church, but it is true generally in society. And many times people feel that if they have a general attitude that yes, there is a God, and they're favorably disposed toward the church and prayer and the things that uh, their friends who are religious talk about, uh, and they have a just a very optimistic attitude toward life. Uh, they may not ever really pray, maybe once in a great while, if they're in a pinch, and uh, they don't attend church necessarily, but they have a, a very uh, optimistic attitude. Uh, maybe they were born that way, maybe this is just something that uh, came along in their life, but they are then sometimes called people who have faith. What they've got is a wonderful optimistic attitude, but that misses the mark in terms of what biblical faith is. When the Bible uses the word faith, it means something that is anchored by way of hope and trust in God. And God is the person who hears our prayers, we bring our cares to Him, he guides us. He's the one who deals with the problem of guilt and sin in our life. And we know that we are a part of his family. We're his children. And he has a place prepared for us in heaven when he calls us home. And all of that gives us hope. So the word faith and hope, in the biblical sense, is really quite much more rich and deep than that general comment about if you're an optimistic person, you're a person of faith. Now we can be thankful for that optimism and for their positive spirit toward the church and the things religious, but because they aren't participants in it, we really can't say they are people of faith. But that is one of the general perceptions of what faith is out in society, and we have to recognize that. Now, within the life of the church, there are some misconceptions, and I've got a couple, maybe you have thought of a few others that we ought to talk about and kind of, uh, you know, clear up. There are people, and this is number two on your sheet, who mistake faith in God for a belief in a set of propositions or creedal statements. These can be biblical propositions or truths. These can be the creeds of the church, such as the Apostles' Creed, or the Nicene Creed. They can be very wonderful documents. And I'm a 
afraid that we need to admit that within the life of the church, again and again, there are people who put their faith in propositional statements that they know very well, but people who have fixated on these statements and have not moved beyond the statements about God to a personal faith in the living God. I don't know if you identify with that or if you know people for whom that may be true, but it does happen within the life of the church again and again where people will mistake orthodoxy, that is to say knowing the right answers and having a good understanding of the Bible, but their prayers are abstract and impersonal and they don't uh, give a sense that this person has a faith relationship in the living Lord. Well, I see a few heads saying, yeah, it's very possible. You know, there was a television program a number of decades ago called The $64,000 Question. Maybe a few of you have heard of it. They made a movie about it, as a matter of fact. And there was a person who came to be a contestant, and the category that he elected was the category of the Bible. So every week this man would get into that soundproof uh, booth and they would feed him the questions. And every week he answered them correctly. And every week they became more difficult until the time came when he had the final question, which was a $64,000 question, and he answered that. And so this was a, a big celebrative event. The uh, first person who had really, you know, aced it like that. Well, as the thing unfolded, they found out that there was some slipping of answers to this man. He knew the Bible very, very well, but they wanted to be sure. And so uh, a movie was made about this. I think the man's name was Van Duren, but I am not totally sure on the uh, accuracy of that. But I do know this, that uh, a newspaper reporter followed up on this man and wanted to do an interview with him and as he sat and talked to this man, he found out that even though he had all of this knowledge about the Bible, he was not a Christian. He did not have faith in God. <laughs> so you see, it's a, quite an example of a, the possibility of having a lot of information, and you can believe that these things are true, but never having committed your life to the Lord that these statements point to. So Bible knowledge and information from Scripture and the creeds and all of these things that are important or good is very, very significant, but they are meant to be a step toward a better understanding of the Lord to whom we then relate to personally. We need to be able to say to God that we love Him. We need to personally say to God that we put our life in His hands and we are going to let him be in the driver's seat of our life. Let him not only take care of our sin problem, but also of guiding us for what he wants to make of the rest of our life. Lordship, that's what that means, Lordship. And that's a personal tie, and that's an exciting pilgrimage. That's an exciting pilgrimage. So much more than people who have got a lot of answers to biblical information but those are the people that are not the happy campers in the church, I'll tell you that. Because it, it, it doesn't work well to be educated far beyond what you are experiencing. And it's so much more exciting to experience what the Bible is talking about because now you're in the stream of, of God's power to enable you to tap in and, and realize what the Bible is talking about. All right, I want to move on to one other that I list in the sheet here. Some mistakenly think of faith in God as the opposite of reason. Let us say, some people feel that uh, you either are going to uh, live a life where you use your head and you exercise reason, or you're going to live a life of faith. Now that's not true. Nowhere in the Bible 
do you find faith and reason set in opposition? They are not opposites. The Bible nowhere indicates that. The Bible does say that there is uh, a distinction between walking by faith and walking by sight. You find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now we walk by faith. That's the only way for a Christian. We all need to walk by faith in the Lord. And when he takes us home, that passage says, then we walk by sight. But until then, we walk by faith. It is an article of faith that this is authoritatively the Word of God. And it is an article of faith that the Jesus Christ that's portrayed there is in fact the Savior and that he did rise from the dead, that he did pay for my sins and your sins on the cross. Those are articles of faith. And then we walk with that. And uh, now, where does reason come in then? Well, the Bible says that we, the first and great commandment is this, you shall love the Lord your God. It's Old Testament and New Testament. You shall love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. God expects us to use our minds. God expects us to use our common sense. God gave it to us. We are to glorify him with the things that he gave us to use. But we must realize that there is a limitation to what we can know with our finite minds, what we can reason. I used to think when I was in college that I would finally come across some philosopher who would put it all together and uh, would, would have all the final answers. Well, the search is futile. I don't know why I ever thought there would possibly be that. It just was my immaturity. The Bible says that we cannot by reason find God. Second Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 indicates that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So reason takes us only so far. And then there are things that you will not get a hold of. We will not understand. We will not grasp with our mind. They are beyond reason. These are things that God reveals to us by the power of his spirit and which we can put our arms around by faith and accept them even though our finite mind cannot grasp them. There are, there's reality beyond what reason can comprehend. But of course, you remember from the first study in uh, Genesis, uh, we are told in the book of Genesis early on that we are to subdue the earth and uh, we are to uh, uh, have dominion over the earth. Well, that presupposes that God is going to take people who have scientific bents and uh, sharp reasoning minds to begin to unlock the secrets of nature and to make discoveries and inventions flow from that and insights flow from that and we're in a era that is burgeoning with you know information but also technological developments that will blow us you know out of the water uh, as to what may happen in this new millennium all of those things come because God has given us a mind to work with and that's of God and that needs to be controlled by the guidance that God gives us in the area of faith. If the things that we discover in the area of science is not controlled with the things in the area that God reveals to us in faith, then we're, we're in for difficulty, obviously. All right, now, if you have questions on that, we're gonna be able to talk about that in a second. But what I want you to do is to look at your paper now and we're going to take a start at what biblical faith is. And what I've got here are four different usages of the word faith in the Bible. The Bible uses that word in four different ways. And before we 
go any further in this study, we need to know which one of those ways we're looking at for today's study. So what I've given you is four verses from the Bible, and then A, B, C, and D below that, descriptions of the four different kinds of faith. And we're going to take a break, and what I want you to do is to work independently and to match the A, B, C, and D with the verses that are above it. All right, with that instruction, we'll take a break. Where our picture begins with the three hands. And uh, we're going to take a look at what you would call an analysis of faith. Now that we have settled uh, and know what we're talking about in terms of biblical faith, we want to dissect it. <laughs> and I have to tell you that what you've got in Hebrews 11, which was a part of your reading assignment for this week, you have all the catalog of the heroes of the faith. And the caption in your Bible reads, examples of faith. And it gives one person after another person after another person after another person. And it tells uh, just a little bit about them. And it all points to the fact that they were people of faith. So the Bible typically uh, uses the method of just letting us see faith in action in the lives of the biblical characters, the people. But classical theology has said, well, let's look at those verses of scripture that point to various parts of faith. So we can analyze it and pick out its various components. And I guess I'd have to say that the one is thinking more like a Hebrew and the other is thinking more like a Greek. But nonetheless, you do find in the Bible various verses that talk about where uh, faith has one part, but not, it's not a, a saving faith. And faith has another part, but it is not an effective faith. So there is benefit, I think, in doing what this study does, is to take a look at the constituent components of a mature or an adult faith, okay? So, this hand refers to the first part of faith, and they call it noetia, no, notitia, but it refers to knowledge. That's the foreign terminology for knowledge. That's what this hand refers to. This hand refers to assent, and this hand refers to fiducia or trust. And now we need to take a look at what those three parts are. You need all three to have an effective faith. And we'll take them one by one and ask a few questions about it and then we'll take a break to discuss it. Well, the first one, knowledge alone does not constitute faith. We already demonstrated that in the illustration about the, the $64,000 question. He had a lot of knowledge, but he did not have a faith. And the verse I quote here is from James chapter 2, verse 19. Do you still think it is enough just to believe that there is one God? Well, even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So, as far as information and data and knowledge is concerned, the demons have that. And you know that they do not have a saving faith. They don't have a working faith. So knowledge alone is not sufficient. But is it important? It is. If you do not have knowledge, you have a blind faith. If you don't have knowledge, you have a faith without substance. And when you stop to think of it, why would God reveal all of what we have in the Bible, the Word of God written, which includes a lot of information, things that we would put in the category of knowledge, biblical knowledge. Why would God give that to us if it were not important for living a life of faith? He wants us to have a faith that's got substance. And you know, 
it is important, especially in our day, because a lot of the people that may come to your doorstep and talk to you about their religion, or informally, somebody at the job may be discussing, you know, at, uh, religion, and they may come from a completely different viewpoint, but they use a word that's a biblical word. And you may immediately think, oh, they believe exactly like we do. The key question is, does that word have a biblical content to it? And for many of these people, they have their own construct in terms of what that word means in their religion. And it is not necessarily the scriptural context. A lot of people will use the word Jesus. But is it the Jesus of scripture? See, that's the key question. So, knowledge is important. Although all by itself, it certainly is not an effective faith. So, let's take a look at the second hand, assent. Now, what is assent? It has to do with uh, uh, our saying, that piece of knowledge is right on. That what you have gathered from the scripture is true. It's rock solid. I can wrap my arms around that. I give my wholehearted assent to it. It is valid. It's of God. That's assent. And it's got an emotional component connection with it. If, if the one is cognitive, the other is a bit more emotional. It, 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 it adds a sense of resoluteness. It's not all in the head. It's now a part of the fabric of, wow, yes. This has got an exclamation point to it. Ascent uh, gives something of a, oh, there's more than our head that's involved in this. This is a touch of our heart as well. So, uh, what is ascent and what part does it contribute to faith? Well, it contributes resoluteness. It, it contributes a fervor. And it contributes a sense that you don't have to guess whether that person buys into this whether they think it's true. You know that. So assent is a step beyond just knowledge. Knowledge can be kind of give it or t leave it, you know, just a fact in the head. But now assent begins to <coughs> seep into the heart level. So we go to the third, which is called fiducia. And that is translated trust. And the verse of scripture that I want to uh, give to you for that in your worksheet is from the lips of Jesus Christ. He said, everyone then who hears these words of mine, now that would, <coughs> that, that would be in the area of knowledge, who hears these words of mine, and you may even assent to them, okay? <coughs> and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock, Matthew 7, 24. So what now does trust contribute to the element of faith? It contributes action. So the person says, I know, that's knowledge. I love it and believe it's true. I'm resolute about it. That's assent. And now the person says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so trust in the Bible is not a passive word. Trust is a word that means action. It means putting it into play in your life. And obviously we know that that is very, very, very important. There's, there's an awful lot of knowing and yes saying it's of God but people still kind of let it lie there without letting it become a part of the fabric of their life. So it's interesting faith involves the total person. Sometimes psychologists will say we're made up of three parts. 
Cognitive, that's the mind. Emotive or affective, and that's the emotional aspect of our being. And the third is the will, which is the I will do it, and the movement to get into action regarding it. So we're going to take a break. And you've got uh, two questions on your worksheet. We're going to talk about those questions and uh, any other items that you want to talk about with regard to the three constituent parts of an adult faith. And with that, we'll take a break. The spiral of light around the upper hand and arm. This light here refers as it always does in the Bethel pictures, to the action of God. And it's good. That wonderful light that shows again and again in pictures indicates God's grace. God giving what we cannot accomplish on our own. And in this case, what we cannot accomplish is faith. We cannot say, today I'm going to faith it. And then expect that we're going to conjure it up in our own own life. The Bible teaches that only God by the power of his Holy Spirit is able to make faith born in our life. It is the gift of God. That's what that light refers to. Faith and all of it, salvation itself, is a gift of God. And Ephesians 2 8 is the verse that tells it so clearly. <clears throat> For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. So, if we would make the mistake of saying, well, <clears throat> Jesus and I are partners in this matter of salvation. Jesus provides the cross, and I provide the faith. And I'm not going to say what percentage credit he gets and what percentage credit I get, but I've got a part in it, and together salvation is accomplished. That would reduce faith to the category of works righteousness. And that the Bible outlines categorically. It is not our doing, it is God's doing. So then that raises the question, does it not? If we cannot then be the author of faith, if we're not able to faith it, so to speak, all on our own strength, if this is something that God needs to do inside of us, then are we totally passive? Do we fold our arms and say, well, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to just wait until God, by his Holy Spirit, gives me the gift of faith because I can't do anything about it? And obviously the answer to that is, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So what I've done on your worksheet is to give you three Bible verses, and they're numbered one, two, three, that point out the kind of things that we can do. And if you've got a friend, if you've got a neighbor, if you've got anyone that you have in mind that is struggling with this matter of how do I come to faith? <coughs> you can say, here are things that you can do whereby God then will bring faith into your life. You know, sometimes people say, uh, uh, <clears throat> whether it's a fellow or whether it's a gal, well, I, I want to get married. Well, the first thing we need to say to ourselves, if that's who we are, you've got to go to places where you can possibly fall in love. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah. <laughs> you've got to go. And then if you're smart, you'll go to places, if you, if you want to uh, meet the right kind of people, you go to the kind of places where the right kind of people are gathered. Mm -hmm. 
and and it's in being at the right place at the right time in finding connections with the potential people that love happens okay well faith is very much like love and uh, that uh, analogy may break down a little here or there but overall that's that's it so what i want you to do is to take a look at those verses and then jot down <coughs> the kind of things that you would suggest to a friend uh, and say this is how you can have faith god will bring it to your life and you'll know that and it'll happen when you follow this kind of a pattern so let's take a break and you go and work at that independently if you will written by Sam Shoemaker, and it's called Extraordinary Living for Ordinary Man. And I uh, give you the reference in your worksheet with regard to that title and the author. And there is a chapter in this book that uh, is entitled as follows, How to Find Faith. And I'm going to uh, read a few excerpts out of that chapter so that when you have a friend or you come across someone who is in a somewhat of a seeker mode and ask you well what can I do you know some specific things that you can share with that person and I've outlined the f four things that Sam Shoemaker says that you should know with regard to uh, a, a person who is a seeker. Number one, first admit that you would like to believe. See, this is the difference between an honest doubter and a person who is a doubter but really doesn't want to get rid of their doubts. They may even be proud of them. They may even coddle their doubts because they feel that if they get connected with God, they're going to have to make some changes they don't want to make. They don't want to leave behind some things that they, they feel they will enjoy. They don't yet realize that God's got something better. But the first step is acknowledge that you would like to believe. And he says, admit to yourself that faith is better than not faith. We who believe must always be as good a people as the Lord wants us to be, but we know that sometimes there are conscientious people that are not in the church who may, from outward appearance, look better than some church people. But he says, don't let that turn you away. Because one thing that the people who stand in faith have that the other people do not, he says, they are in touch with the source of God's power. That's a key difference. Second step, go where faith is. Well, let me back up and take it in a little different order. I put it in your, your study sheet as follows. Uh, the step would instead be Start reading and studying the Bible. The New Testament first, and then begin reading in the epistles and the book of Acts. Perhaps in a modern speech translation, see what the early church thought about Jesus, who he was, and what was central in the Christian faith. Then go back and read the Gospels. And for those who want to start the faith experiment, I frequently recommend, Sam Shoemaker says, and he recommends a book by E. Stanley Jones called Abundant Living. That may be found in some of your home libraries. Abundant Living by E. Stanley Jones. But at any rate, start reading the Bible. Get involved in a Bible study group. And now we go to the item that I started a little bit ago. Go where faith is. You can, and some do, find faith in a vacuum, all by yourself, by thought, suffering, and observation. But a much more natural process is to go where people have faith and consult with them and see how they get, got started. That's where the church comes in. All of us who love the church are aware of her human defects. 
we are all apt to see the whole rather than the donut. Interesting comment. You know, John Calvin called the church the mother of faith. Very important comment. There is more faith and consecration in the church than you may think. What we are saying is that faith comes through fellowship. And I believe that the church must break down into small fellowship groups in which people can gather informally and air their questions and hear from others how they resolve their doubts and come to believe. And now he adds a fourth. The fourth thing that helps us to find faith is to simply begin with a spiritual experiment. Begin reading your Bible. Begin going to church. Begin acting as if God is there when you pray. If you feel doubt, tell God about it. Be honest with Him. Call on Him when first you awaken in the morning. Say familiar prayers like the Lord's Prayer. Ask Him to use you this day to guide you in your work and to help you with some of the naughty problems of your life. Tell God about it. He will make Himself known to you. Try and continue to try that spiritual experiment. Not much happens when you remain on dead center. But get off dead center. Allow the line of best light to guide you. Get in motion. You can't guide a bicycle that's leaning against a wall. You can only guide a bicycle that is in motion. I think that uh, analogy of a bicycle is a good uh, illustration. You and I know, you can read all about how the dynamics of balance you know, work and how the bicycle is constructed, that's knowledge. And you can believe that that bicycle is strong enough to hold you up. That's, <coughs> that's a scent. But until you push off, you don't really learn to ride. And what you find is that you begin, and I can still remember, you know, the first time I rode a bicycle. I grew up on a farm where I had a pony and I didn't have a bicycle. And it wasn't until I got next to, you know, my friend from town who said, well, try to ride my bicycle. So it was pushing off. And then I began to feel the dynamics of balance taking over. And I didn't tip over, even though I felt like, you know, that would surely happen to me. There is something about aerodynamics that bears you up. Now, when we start to read the Bible and have the experiment, experiment that God hears our prayer and we fellowship and worship and, and are with other people who have faith and we begin to say, I'm going to push off. I'm going to pray to God, Lord, give me the gift of faith. Lord, I love you. Lord, I put my problems of life into your hands. That simple kind of prayer, prayer is a pushing off. And we begin now to get into the stream of God's Holy Spirit power. That Holy Spirit power I compare to that sensation of riding the bicycle when all of a sudden you begin to feel that, hey, you, you run stable with a little speed. You, it, it stays upright. That's, to me, a illustration or a parallel to the Holy Spirit's power. And so when a person says, I will try the experiment, and they get started, they begin to feel God's Spirit taking over and guiding them and blessing them in that walk. And I feel that that is really uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing for us to have in our <coughs> awareness because all of us need to be lights to show people the way. We need to be able to show people the way. And Sam Shoemaker was blessed of God in such a marvelous way <coughs> in doing this for untold hundreds of people in personal contacts. Now we move to the last item <coughs> of our picture and that has to do with the fact that the flowers on this side of the wreath are all in full bloom. 
Lots of color. Brilliant. Good looking. Fresh. Fragrant. And this is a picture of faith that is not only born, but now grows and matures. It grows and matures. And friends, you and I can take each one of those three things that we talked about above here in terms of staying in the word, reading the scripture expectantly and prayerfully, praying, having a very solid time day by day, alone with God in prayer and meditation, and being in a Christian fellowship where you can worship and where other people can encourage you. The book of Hebrews says, do not neglect the gathering of yourselves together as the pattern of some is, that people may encourage each other. That's in the book of Hebrews, that book on faith. If we take that as a pattern for our life, we will find our faith maturing and growing and growing. That's what God wants for our life. And so uh, I have here Mark 9, 24 as a Bible reference. And this is the section of scripture where you have Jesus coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And you remember the story of how a father with a son who was having all kinds of problems was demon possessed, in matter of fact. And the father came to those disciples and said, uh, can you help me? And the the disciples tried to deal with uh, the problem, and it failed. Then Jesus came down from the mountain, and the Father went to Jesus and asked for help. He said, and these are his words, If you can, Lord. And Jesus responded, Well, if you have faith that I can. <laughs> and, and then the man said, I believe, help thou my unbelief or help me with my doubts. Well, that clearly indicates that there is an embryonic faith, and then there is a faith that builds and grows. Now, you'll notice with encouragement that Jesus did not snub that father. He did not. Jesus loves and has patience with embryonic faith, with people who have honest doubts, too. Take a look again at that upper room experience where you have Thomas saying, I, I, I'm not believe unless I see the, the nail prints and put my hand in his side. And then the Lord appeared a while later and Jesus invited him to do so. Jesus was not hard on Thomas. The Lord has patience with people who have legitimate and honest doubts and he asks them to take a step forward. Try and see. Now, <clears throat> I want to close this with one of my favorite sections that comes from the book of Genesis about a mature faith in the life of Joseph. And <clears throat> Joseph is now very old. And it comes time for him to recognize that uh, his days are going to be very few. And in the 50th chapter of the book, of Genesis, Joseph says, soon I will die, but God will surely come for you to lead you out of this land of Egypt. See, Joseph knew what the promise was. God had said that he would lead his people out. Now it's going to be years before Moses comes to do this. But Joseph knew what the promise was. And then Joseph said, when God comes to lead us back to Canaan, you must take my body back with you. So Joseph died at the age of 110. They embalmed him and his body was laid in a coffin in Egypt. Now we come to the book of Exodus and the deliverance happens and now the Exodus takes place and guess what? They have the bones of Joseph with him. What a wonderful, wonderful thing for the young children and all the adults as well, to understand that Joseph, who lived so much longer ago, believed God enough that this would happen today, an exodus from Egypt, 
and they're carrying his bones to be buried in Canaan as he requested. That's a beautiful story of a faith that had matured through the years, nurtured by God's Spirit. And that's what God wants for you and for me. And the life of faith is a wonderful, promising life. And with that, we close our study on the subject of faith.